back to school. <laughs> More for me than you, I think. Excuse me, I have to do this from paper because it's been a while since I've been in school. This really feels like school for me. <laughs> Thank you very much for the introduction and the opportunity to speak. Beautiful crowd. More people than I expected. Yes, this is very anti-2019 advertising. I very much make a point to smoke in every press photo that we have. <laughs> so, this morning I was given the task or the opportunity as well to discuss under the guise of Muse. So what I want to discuss is actually what the hospitality industry means to me. Discuss my inspirations, but also discuss some things that I think can also inspire people. So I flipped it. So my name's Alex. I am the chef and owner of 101 Gallery in Amsterdam. I am 29 years old, I believe now. I stopped counting after a while. You are. You are. 101 Gallery basically is a small restaurant in the pipe. We can see 26 people, and basically we serve set venues that focus on Dutch produce, very much talk about balance, and it's heavily influenced by my heritage, which is half Japanese, half German. I grew up in Australia. Yes, it's slightly confusing. But, um, so basically, in a nutshell, what we actually, what, or what I and my team do is that we basically create the most curated house party that you will ever go to. So in small tapes or two small tapes. Um, we cook very much with the Australian sensibility, with a big focus on minimalism and just presenting what is essential trying to take all the bullshit away from place so that it's just really focusing on the ingredients and what we want to communicate on the plate. So the initial and forever goal of one on Gary is to create an experience that's very much informal, but then with a high level of focus on details. How we view things is that the guest experience begins upon the reservation and then it finishes when you guys get home. Not a very common thought, I think. In between all this is a huge list of details that happen day by day. I'm not going to bore you with all those details. Basically, we can start with food philosophy. I think that's the most interesting thing when it comes to food. So, obviously, what I focus on is working with seasonal products, trying to find a lot of balance, not only on the plate, but then with the menu overall, because it's the whole experience. And then, with that in mind, cooking with a lot of thought. So basically, is the dish balanced enough? What are we trying to feature on each plate? Um, how do we find balance in the menu overall? Um, are we able to dictate certain emotions on the plate without you knowing about it? <laughs> Have the place maybe gone too far? You know, can we take things away? Is there a way that we can make it simpler just to be more towards the point? These are all the basic questions that happen before the dishes make the menu and then get presented to the guests. Sometimes we're getting good guests, so make a good name. <laughs> Creatively, the inspiration for this food, it can come from anywhere. It can come from a product, what we're trying to feature. It can come from, you know, a late night drunk at McDonald's. It can come literally in the middle of my sleep. Like sometimes I wake up at like two, three in the morning, flip the phone open and then go on notes and go, okay, this, this is a good idea. And then if I wake up and it's still good, it might happen. <laughs> and then other times it's just about running the simplest idea and just going with it. Like with the coffee, for example, you know, always we serve a mini D, like a little, a little something. Most restaurants will serve like a bonbon or a shit cookie or something that's a bit like, eh, I don't really want this. We serve poffages. We cook them to order. Everyone fucking loves poffages. It goes great with coffee. <laughs> that's the simple side to the food philosophy. In terms of the greatest theme of restaurants, most people teach you that in order to stay ahead of the game, you must follow your competitors. I don't find that so true. What we try to do is actually stay in our own bubble, because food-wise, essentially everything's been done. There is nothing that you can create today that's genuinely 100% original. The most original thing to happen these days is probably lab-grown meat and vegetable-based me. I mean, let's, let's be serious, how exciting is that really? I mean, it's kind of fucked up, right? <laughs> With that, if we stay in this bubble, my theory is, is that 
what we then create, it might not be 100% original, but to us, it's something that we're genuinely inspired by. So it's ours. It doesn't matter if it's original or not, but it comes from us, and that's what's really important to me. So that's food. It's a basic understanding of food. You can give some food. Or your lives, I think. Um, I want to discuss hospitality as an industry. So what it means to me, obviously, and basically, from my standpoint, obviously I'm very biased, but hospitality for me is the best career choice you can ever make. One, it doesn't cost much to do it. So, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people here go to university, I mean, it's costing you a bit of money, right? <laughs> you don't need a loan to start hospitality, but it's also a career that can take you around the world. You're employable around the world. Kitchen is a language. You don't, it doesn't matter if you speak Spanish, English, Dutch, German, Swedish, it doesn't matter. Everyone speaks the same language in a kitchen. But then the problem is, is that often people who work in hospitality are asked always the questions like, okay, so what do you do before this? Do you have another job? What are you going to do after this? Uh, this and that. I mean, sometimes it feels like we're always on a job trial, but then this is very much a serious career. And the thing that's often forgotten is that hospitality is an industry overall. It's run by people. So, I mean, to question what they are doing in that sort of way, it's a bit, you know, it's a bit concerning for me. But basically, I grew up in restaurant kitchens, which, in terms of hospitality scene overall, we see ourselves as the elite. I mean, it's a, it's a bit douchey, but it really is the truth. You can break up hospitality into different sectors. So you have like cafes, bars, restaurants, hotels, catering, there's all, all these different facets, but in terms of kitchens, restaurant kitchens is essentially the highest point you can get. It's the most pressure, it's the most everything. What this means growing up in restaurant kitchens is that the better part of my late teens and early 20s, I essentially didn't have much of a life. I worked 16 to 18 hour days, six days a week. I've worked every Christmas and New Year's from probably 16 till now. It's been a while since I've had Christmas. And in and amongst all this, you know, I've dealt with high pressure, high pressure situations, being screamed at, being thrown, had things thrown at me, and basically have lived under fluorescent light. I'm actually not this pale, normally. <laughs> um, and you know, um, underneath all these tattoos and things, there's a lot of scars to show for it. Basically, I mean, to get an insight of how rough the industry can be. So I used to work in this restaurant in Sydney. At the time, it was one of the best up-and-coming, very French, very hardcore kitchen. It was intense. We'd start at 5 in the morning, finish it, like, uh, sort of start at 5 in the morning, and then finish at 2 o'clock in the morning the following day. The way that we were motivated was by fear, so, yeah. You think it's funny, it's not funny, huh? <laughs> and, you know, most of the time it was verbal abuse. Sometimes people get physically abused. I've seen someone burn another person, give them third degree burns in the middle of service and then they have to work through that shit. And one night in particular, I was working, I was a second year apprentice, so I was in my second year of learning to become a chef. And, you know, basically I was fucking everything up. I didn't know what I was doing and, you know, with certain people, if you shout at them, they'll work better. But then others, if you shout at them, they don't work better. So, you know, I was just getting hurdled abuse, and that night there was actually a table of six sitting in front of the kitchen. It was an open kitchen. And, you know, there were some words that were said directly at me, and obviously it didn't make me feel very good. It didn't make me work any better, but then the saddest part about it is that the guests at the table in front of the dining room were laughing. That was the worst part. But the way I dealt with that is by basically, in my mind, I was like, okay, you know what, fuck these people. I'm going to train so hard and bury myself in work that I become so good that when I meet these people again, they won't even know who the fuck I am. And if they do see me again, then they'll know who I am. Maybe not the best way to deal with it, <laughs> but I 
was 19 at the time. My family were living in Dover. They'd moved there for work. So my whole family was overseas. I had basically no support network, and the only thing I had to do was swim. That's what I had to do. I had to work, I had to pay rent, and, you know, hospitality is what I'm good at, so I just did it. And now I'm here. Now I get to talk in front of people. <laughs> There's a large majority in this industry that grow up like this, and they hold these experiences and all these things quite proudly. I used to, but I don't see that as a very healthy way of dealing with this. It's something that's kind of sheltered in the industry. People are really proud of all these scars and all this, all this shit they go through. But it's not how an industry should work, in my opinion. I mean, luckily, through all these experiences, I think I've taken the steps to deal with it after many years and then realize what I want to achieve in the industry and then how I want to teach people. Because that's something that's really important to me now and for the last couple of years. We'll get to that. Basically, to give you another insight of the change. So, I mean, after the apprenticeship years, you know, I got through it, I learned, I did well, I gained the skills to become, you know, essentially the cook I am today. Like, if you want something cooked, I can do it. And I don't need a recipe, I can just do it. It's in my head somewhere. <laughs> and then it moves up to the, basically after you reach the point of becoming a good cook, you cook, you start moving into the forms of leadership. And then here in Amsterdam, I was actually given an opportunity at the age of 24 to open a restaurant for a really famous chef here. Um, and unfortunately, I became the thing that I hated. So I exacerbated the problem and followed along the hereditary line of the terrible practices of the industry. So I opened this restaurant, I was new to the country, I had a team of 17 cooks, and then there was a team of about 25 in front of us. And the way I dealt with opening the restaurant was to control the kitchen by fear and power. And to a certain extent it worked, like we got the job done and the aim was basically to do anything it took to make sure that the job got done. But then the flip side to that is that the team of 17 that I began with, after three weeks was a team of six. Yeah, not very healthy. So basically after doing that job for about eight months, I burnt out, I went insane. I went underground and then about three months, and took about three months off and then resurfaced. I think it took me about up until middle of last year that I truly came out of this experience. That held on to me for a long, 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 long time. But the positive side to all this is that, again, I realized then what type of leader I wanted to be and what type of person I wanted to be inside of the kitchen. It's no longer about cooking. It's about more than that, right? And then obviously with these experiences, I can take this into 101 Gallery, because now I'm an owner, you know? And that ties into the whole restaurant ownership and leadership thing. The biggest challenge and the biggest aspect of running a kitchen or a business is how you manage people and also how you manage yourself. I mean, running people with fear doesn't work. It never will. And I think that's quite positive. As one on one galleries of business, so I created it in a way to make sure that what we created was sustainable for the person. So it was a conscious business decision to close on Sundays and Mondays so that we can ensure that everyone has at least one weekend day off and they also have two consecutive days off. We exercise two break periods, so in the summer we close for three weeks in August and then in January, we close for another two weeks, so everyone gets five weeks of paid holiday. And then on top of that, everyone is given what I like to call like the open door policy. So if I open the door to everyone, so that if they have something they want to talk about, if they're going through something, they need an extra day off, they want to go to a wedding, or whatever it is, if I can do something to help in any way, then I'll do it. This is something I never got when I was working in hospitality. And then the biggest goal to, to creating the restaurant is also to create a work environment where we can motivate, train people, and create a really positive work environment. That's something that's really important because, I mean, I think positivity will thrive over negativity, right? So, in order to create that, 
where that begins is then with the people. The way that I hire people essentially is by hiring people on their motivation and their attitude as opposed to their skill set. I mean, we can teach skills to people, but you can't take an asshole out of a dickhead. It's not possible. <laughs> you know what I mean? If we can hire and find these type of people, that's 50% of the job that we need to do at the restaurant. The other 50% of the job is how I'm able to motivate them and then also put across my ethos to them. And that's, it's that simple to begin with. That's the foundation of any good business, I think. And then, I just want to quickly talk about something that's really important to me and then I think that very much ties into all of this, right? It is about mental health in the hospitality industry. The reason I want to talk about this is that obviously there is a majority that's speaking about it and there's a big conversation obviously about mental health in a lot of different industries. My problem is, is that nothing's actually fucking happening. People are talking about it, but no one's doing anything about it, which is really challenging, right? I think most people that work in hospitality either are suffering or have suffered from something, whether it be anxiety, depression, or whatever it is. I mean, me personally, I have anxiety and depression issues. That's my thing. This comes, I think, a lot of the time through expectation. So in the hospitality industry, there is, and especially in restaurants, there's an expectation that every day you have to show up on time or early, you need to work as hard as you can, and you need to make sure that every day, every service, every time you do something, that you're as close as perfect as possible. It's a lot of pressure. Especially imagine doing that when you're 16 years old. It's a lot to take on. And I mean, the scary part of that is that the majority of business, I would say in a way, especially based in hospitality, is geared towards, okay, how do we make the business thrive? When most businesses are run by people, and that's often the most forgotten part, right? It makes no sense. So obviously we try to combat that with one-on-one -on -one gallery by trying to uplift the people that work there by giving them the tools they need to succeed, opening hours, holidays, all these things, a healthy lifestyle, positive workplace, but also in the form of making sure that people are trained properly, that they understand what they're selling, they understand what they're cooking, what they need to do, what they're expected to do, and what, you know, the things that don't really need to happen, but, you know, if they can get there, they can get there. And then obviously we also have very much the open door policy, which, like I said, it's never really existed when I grew up. There's no one, there's very often times when a head chef or your manager or something like that will be so open to even talk to you about your personal things. Normally it's like, if you want to talk about mental health and hospitality, people will always like shrug it off a bit. They're like, oh yeah, don't be such a bitch, get back in there. Oh yeah, you cut yourself? Okay, a good one. I locked off the end of this finger once, and the way that they wanted, they dealt with that is they put a pan on the stove, made it screaming fucking hot. Yeah. <laughs> it still kind of works. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, it was my pinky, so I don't really need that one. I myself and what we have created at the restaurant is really trying to create this positive change to make sure that we can have, you know, ideally an impact throughout the industry. That's my perfect world. The reality is, if it's just us, then we can't do it alone. But we're only so small. I mean, we have a team of about six people. But then if I can make that impact to make sure that the five people, not including myself, or six, including myself, if we're able to create an environment that has a positive impact on these people's lives and careers, that's a win for me. And hopefully, that will then trickle into other systems. But we need other people to get on board with this system. Right? And then... You know, in terms of the positive change, if we're able to create it in the restaurant and make a few people's lives better and add to their lives, then I think as well, to a certain extent, the guests feel that as well. I mean, you, if all of you come in twice this week, for example, and on one day, if I'm fucking pissed off one day and I'm having a bad day, I'm moody, something happened, I stubbed my toe when I woke up, I stepped in a pile of dog shit before I walked in the door, I'm not having a good day. You will taste that. And then the next day, if I'm having a great day, birds are chirping, sun's out, it hasn't rained for a week, I'm good. You will taste that. Mental health 
in the hospitality industry is so essential. It's, it really is. The people is the people are what drive the industry, and that we need the people in order to succeed. So, in terms of the future of the hospitality industry, it really does lie in all the people. Hopefully, we can work as a collective to create this brighter future, and then you know we're doing our best to make sure that that can happen at least in our small world. And uh, thank you for coming today.